All right, all right. So <clears throat> thanks everyone for being here. Um, this is the last of um, four sessions that are curated today by the Internet Infrastructure Coalition. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Internet Infrastructure Coalition is a group of infrastructure providers, web hosts, registrars, registries that are committed to uh, ensuring that the internet remains awesome. And uh, I'm one of the co-founders of the I2C, along with Christian Dawson, who's sitting back there. Um, so if you have any questions, go ask him. Um, <laughs> the, the I2, if you want to go on, uh, if you want to look at our website, it's at i2coalition.org. Um, and so what we're talking today about today is um, the future of privacy and uh, privacy legislation. And on the, on the panel today, we have five um, diverse people who are really kind of experts in, in privacy. The way we're gonna, I'm gonna work the panel today is uh, we're gonna talk for about half an hour uh, about different privacy-related issues, and I'll leave about um, 10 to 15 minutes at the end to talk about any issues uh, that, that you, want, you didn't think I'd addressed or you want to have uh, get more information on. Um, so we'll start, I'll introduce the panelists and I'll start right here with Katie McAuliffe. Uh, Katie is the Federal Affairs Manager for Americans for Tax Reform and she's the Executive Director of Digital Liberty. Um, before that, she, wa she worked for Congressman Cliff Stern's DC office and blogs at digitalliberty.net, and she is an awesome person to lobby with. Um, she is great on ECPA reform, so I love that. Um, next to her is Greg Nojaim, and Greg is Senior Counsel and Director on the Project on Freedom, Security, and Technology at the Center for Democracy and Technology. Um, we, the I2C works with the Center for Democracy and Technology a lot on a number of issues, so Greg is, Greg is great. Um, he is actually a great expert on the Fourth Amendment and on electronic surveillance and national security in general. And he has specific expertise in the Foreign Surveillance, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which I think might come in handy on, on this panel, given what we know that's come out in the, um, in the news. Next to him, we have Julian Sanchez. Julian is a fellow at the Cato Institute. And um, at the Cato Institute, he works on issues related to technology, privacy, and civil liberties. Um, and he was the Washington editor for Ars Technica. Um, next to Julian is Jane Shi. Jane is the corporate counsel at the Endurance International Group. And she's very involved in EIG's policy focus. Um, and she founded an internal blog called Think About Policy. And it's designed to, uh, in, to, to help people at Endurance think more about how they can make the web a better place for customers and employees. Um, Endurance is one of the founding members of the I2 Coalition, so we're very proud to have her on the, on the panel today. And next to Jane, we have Ron Yokobitis. Ron is one of the co-founders of Golden Frog. And Golden Frog is a software company that's committed to developing applications and services that preserve an open internet experience. Um, I can vouch for their uh, Viper VPN uh, product. I used it in China, and I was able to listen to NPR wherever I went in China, which was excellent. Um, Golden Frog is also uh, an I2 Coalition member, um, and so we're proud to have them here as well. Um, so, to get things started, and so I can talk a little bit about some framing issues um, that are important, what I'd like each of the panelists to spend about two minutes talking about is um, answer the question, what is the state of privacy in the US? And try to identify a law that individuals can rely on to understand your privacy rights, and one that's undermining it, undermining those privacy rights. And since you sat next to me, you get to start. Well, since I'm going first, um, I'm going to hit the one of the easy ones. Um, I'll let Greg take the tougher one. I'm going to go with electronic communications privacy reform. And so you've got legislation right now that in 1986 was great for protecting your email. It gave you um, the warrant requirements, Fourth Amendment protection to your email documents. But now as technology has evolved, we're in a situation where government can access your email, your cloud documents, things that you've marked 
as private on social networking sites, there is a 180 day rule where supposedly they can access your documents with a subpoena just after the 180 days, um, or if they've been opened. So basically you have a warrant requirement for spam in your email. <laughs> and there's also kind of this um, strange dealing with cloud services and saying that just because a third party has it, so since I handed it off to a web hosting company, they can now go after you for my information without letting me know. And they don't need a warrant, they need to, they use a subpoena. And one of Greg's um, jokes that I really like is subpoena is Latin for a judge has never seen this. <laughs> So, uh, yeah. thanks for letting me steal that. Um, <laughs> so, you know, this is something where it was doing a great job to bring the Fourth Amendment into, into technology moving forward into the future, but now we need to change it, and there's a lot going on that's positive in that sphere. Okay. So, hi, I'm Greg Noja. I'm Center for Democracy and Technology. I stole that line. Oh, you stole that from line. From Jim Dempsey. Oh. Uh, a colleague of mine at yeah. Center for Democracy and Technology. This is this is not the copyright panel. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, David, you asked about a law that um, protects our privacy and a law that violates our privacy. And in the reality, each of the privacy laws, the electronic communications privacy laws, does both. Okay. Because they both um, protect the information and then they create exceptions to those protections. The one I want to focus on is the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, or FISA. Here's how it started. We, we were in a world where there was no requirement, in law at least, for the executive to conduct national security wiretapping. And President Nixon was doing it. And Congress said, well, maybe we ought to have a court decide whether the wiretap ought to happen. And so they created the FISA court and they made it so that the government could not conduct uh, wiretapping in the United States it, it, as a general rule without going in front of this court and proving that there was probable cause that the target of the surveillance was a spy or a terrorist or another agent of a foreign power or the foreign power itself. Um, that was actually the high water mark for that law, 1978, in terms of privacy protection. From there on in, it was downhill. There was a new, there was a new rule that you, uh, a few years later, they extended it to physical searches. It didn't used to be the case you could do a physical search for national security reasons. And then um, they decided to create an exception for um, records that, uh, say, a uh, electronic communication service provider maintains. Uh, the, um, I think they were trying to cover uh, both the transactional records and the subscriber information, and they created national security letters. The provision that you've heard a lot about in the last few days, Section 215 of the Patriot Act, that is an amendment to FISA that created a new rule to allow the government to get any tangible thing with a minimal showing to this FISA court. They just have to prove that the information sought, the tangible thing sought, is relevant to an investigation. Um, they did away, for purposes of that very important rule, with that notion that the information sought had to pertain to a terrorist or a spy, and that opened up um, the problem that we have today. Um, it didn't stop there, it got a little worse. The FISA Amendments Act, uh, which was uh, 2008, uh, made it so that you didn't even have to be, um, gosh, it didn't even have to be relevant to an investigation. You didn't have to be conducting an investigation. You could, if you were targeting people who you, uh, through targeting procedures, were reasonably thought to be abroad, that's the only criterion that the FISA court reviews. Are they probably abroad or not? And so what started out as a very protective statute went downhill okay. uh, over the last quarter century. All right, Julian? So uh, like uh, Greg, I, I focus on national security issues. So let me flip this slightly and talk about national security letters, um, which I think are generally bad for privacy, but also about some recent developments that may constrain their scope uh, and use. These are, uh, we actually don't have a, a very clear sense. They only count uh, national security letters for detailed 
information. There are also more limited national security letters just for basic subscriber information. So they'll come and say, we've got a phone number, we've got an IP address, tell us who this person is, what their address is, what their billing information is. They don't count those. Um, they only count the more detailed ones for transactional records um, that are issued that affect American persons. Um, we know those range from about seven to 14,000 people affected every year. The number of letters is often even higher, so this is something you're not unlikely to get at some point uh, if you haven't already. If you haven't already, unfortunately, you can't tell me. Um, National Security Letters started as a fairly limited tool, right? The idea here was to provide an exception from state-level privacy statutes that said, basically, if it's a national security case and the feds come and a company wants to voluntarily turn over records, um, essentially, you have a permission that is an exemption from any state statute that might prevent them from sharing that information. Uh, and then over time, they became compulsory, but it was still only records of the particular subject of an investigation. That is, as someone you actually have at least a reasonable suspicion to believe is an agent of a foreign power. And then, under the Patriot Act, both the number of entities that can be served with a national security letter was expanded, uh, and most significantly, that restriction was removed. So it's now anything relevant to a national security investigation, not necessarily the records of a particular subject you're investigating, perhaps just a whole slew of records so they can look through them and see if someone's activities look suspicious. The, uh, the national security letter you are all most likely to see is an ECPA, Electronic Communications Privacy Act, NSL. That's 18 U.S.C. 2709. By default, they come with a gag order, meaning not only can you not tell the customer that you have been asked to turn over their information, but you cannot reveal in any way the existence of the order. You cannot say anything about the fact that you have received any order. Uh, Google has started negotiating to be allowed to say, well, we've gotten between zero and 1,000 this year, and between 1,000 and 2,000 the year after that. That's after two years of fighting, they got that much permission. Um, there is, however, a decision in a California court that's going to the Ninth Circuit challenging that particular uh, aspect of national security layers, because this is a gag imposed without judicial liberty. This is like subpoenas, but even in a sense more so. These are issued by the heads, the special agent in charge of an FBI field office. That means no judge, not even a federal prosecutor, signs off on these things. And funnily enough, we have a First Amendment, which means normally without judicial process, you cannot just order someone to be permanently silent about something like, I've gotten a thousand national security letters, I think that's a problem. Um, so the Ninth Circuit will be reviewing that to see whether, um, in essence, this is constitutional, whether the gag provision in particular is something that you're going to be allowed to push back against, given what we now know about the scope of what they've been doing with 215. There's a very strong First Amendment argument that, hey, you can't actually use these in a way that potentially affects thousands of records and not let people talk about a fact of public interest, which is how the government's using these powers. So we've, so we've, got, so we've got the First Amendment and the Fourth Amendment right. kind of in kind of working with each well, other. The Fourth Amendment, unfortunately, because of the Smith v. Maryland decision they mentioned is not in play. But just the second very quickly limitation is that in 2008, the Office of Legal Counsel at DOJ said, wait, you've been requesting all transactional information. Again, as you know, the kind of transactional records that are kept by any kind of internet company are often quite expansive. They say, no, 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 the statute says toll billing records. This is kind of a holdover. Uh, so all you can really ask for is toll billing records or the equivalent of toll billing records, phone bill information, not the entire universe of transactional data a company might store. We don't really know what that means, and I've seen redacted versions of letters since then with real long lists blacked out of what they're asking for. Suggests they may still be asking for more than that. Um, so just be aware that if you get one of these, um, it's not clear what the limitations mean exactly, what the internet equivalent of toll billing records are, but they may ask you for all transactional data. It doesn't mean you can or, or legally ought to hand over all transactional data. All right, so, so we've kind of, we've got, got ECPA, FISA, NSLs, Jane, um, <laughs> what, what's left? Yeah, I, um, I don't know if I can really compete with that. You are very <laughs> kind to call me an expert in this area, but I think that my distinguished co-panelists on my right are far more expert than I. Um, I will say, though, that I think in answer to your question that, um, you know, customers perhaps look to the Fourth Amendment, our Constitution, that protects us from unreasonable search and seizure. Um, I'm speaking at a very high level here. 
And I think that what undermines that is interpretations of what that means through um, all of the laws that have just been discussed. And in addition to that, interpretations of what those laws allow. I think what's interesting about what's come up in the recent NSA leaks is that there has been a focus on warrant for content under ECPA. And what this latest episode, I think, reveals is that it's not the content, but actually what's being called metadata can be far more powerful okay. in revealing what we do on a day-to-day -day level. So right. I think that's what's of concern. Ron, you get the last word. Okay, thank you. Um, supposed to get this close and talk. Okay, uh, afternoon everybody. Ron Yokobitis with the Golden Frog. Uh, Viper VPN, and uh, we've been in the internet business starting in 94 uh, down in San Antonio, Texas uh, with Texas.net uh, first ISP down there. So we've been hooking up people when you had to spell internet for them, you know, and been doing it since. Uh, that's a, internet providers are cloud computing companies. Uh, you had to host uh, email, Usenet for those that uh, remember the internet before uh, the mouse clickers took over with the web. But nevertheless, uh, we uh, have been lobbying for privacy since uh, 05, 06. We filed with the FCC trying to, you know, petition our government for redress of grievance. Wouldn't you all like to know that the carriers using deep packet inspection are totally invading your privacy? And uh, we found no purchase with... Uh, uh, either party cared. It was just a dull thud. So we've been, you know, talking privacy and being active on it since then. Uh, after a while, I, I, I decided, being a good Boy Scout, as we operate networks globally, uh, wasn't getting anywhere, you know. So we just decided to start a company. Don't get mad, get even, that would encrypt you and give you some level. I call it you know, to y'all from the Northeast, you don't have uh, guns, but down here in Texas, you know, we're not at the mercy of carjackers. Uh, so uh, I call it the Second Amendment uh, for the Internet. If you don't have a VPN, get one and uh, encrypt inside of a secure tunnel because they are snooping. And if you, but they'll go snoop just like a robber will go rob the one that looks like a victim rather than somebody that looks like, it ain't going to mess with you. Well, you just want to make them not mess with you because I don't think there's any legal anything. So we I'm a lawyer by education and practice. I've practiced law. So uh, I'm, a, I'm an operator from practicing law down in the trenches and uh, litigating uh, criminal and civil. And I was doing that when I started the ISP with my wife and, and my oldest son. And... Uh, uh, we're still, uh, but we're operators. I get tr a tremendous amount of uh, queries from law enforcement for subscriber information uh, in our data center business, uh, search warrant for stuff we can't get them. And uh, it's a constant education process. Uh, I'm starting to think, uh, why do we even keep records? Just tell them, look, go ask the NSA. Okay, so so we have we have we have encryption. Encryption is a, is is the same as guns now. That's well, you've got to defend yourself. Well, okay, all right. So we have we have encryption, guns, um, NSA, NSL, FISA, and ECPA. Um, I, I think I think we're we're, we're hitting all the uh, all the the constitutional issues that might might actually be talked about right now. So let's let's talk about ECPA. Um, real quickly, so ECPA, ECPA is something that the I2 Coalition is working um, pretty hard on uh, to advance the, um, the, the, rep, the changes to ECPA that are pending uh, on the Senate. So why don't we talk a little bit about ECPA. Greg, why don't you talk about kind of what, what the amendments um, are proposing and what, what the future might be and, and what we're looking to do. So as, uh, as Katie said, Right now, the law says once email is older than 180 days old, and DOJ says once you open an, a younger email, it's not protected by the warrant requirement. And on top of that, everything you store with a company, so you can come back to and use from wherever you are, everything you're just storing and you're coming back to, 
That's not protected by the warrant requirement either. Rule made sense 27 years ago when it was adopted and there was no World Wide Web and you know, storage was expensive. And I know what I used to do. I would download my email into the computer and I'd print it out. I mean, and the providers, they couldn't save um, email for a long time. So that rule that made sense in those days, if it was more than six months old, it was probably abandoned makes no sense today. And it's not a good rule for business either because you can't promise your customer the same level of privacy that they would have if they stored the information locally. And that's one of the big arguments in DC is to try to make it tech neutral. So you can store it locally, you can store it in the cloud, doesn't matter, same protection applies. And um, I think people are starting to get that. We're making some good progress. We got the bill through, uh, a bill to require warrants for all communications content. We got that through uh, Senate Judiciary with no bad amendments on a voice vote. Um, it's ready for the floor. We've got one big issue to iron out uh, or win on before we uh, get to the floor, and then we move on to the House. Uh, so I think on ECPA reform, we're making the best progress out of probably any electronic communications uh, privacy issue. So, so Katie, why don't you talk a little bit about the one big issue that we, that we, that we have to deal with, and this is this proposal, I guess, well, I'll let you, you, you talk about um, what's being proposed. So there is discussion uh, to include an amendment that would kind of create a new warrant standard or an exception for civil investigations for federal agencies. That means your whole alphabet soup of agencies would be able to kind of bypass the structure and not need a warrant. So we're talking about organizations like the SEC, the EPA, um, FCC, FTC, all of these different organizations. The reason that's a problem is because, you know, one of these people is um, the IRS would no longer have this kind of well, the IRS clearly doesn't want to be reined in at all, so clearly this exception would be a bad idea. I mean, it would be an amendment that lets the IRS say, yeah, we can still read your email. It says it in their handbook that they can read their, your email. They took a step back, and some of the hearings on the House side, they've stepped back saying, oh, the 180-day rule isn't really you know, something that we follow, and there's no reason for that to be there. But then by adding this exception, you really walk all of that back. So these agencies would then, also they would have the ability to start a civil investigation and bypass the warrant requirement, but then anything that goes on in a civil investigation can be shared in a criminal investigation. So now you've got this information that bypass the warrant requirement for a criminal investigation. It's shared over there. And then also for civil investigations, there's a lesser standard than there is for a criminal investigation. Why, why does that make sense? So, you know, and the reason that they put out there is that, oh, you know, the SEC needs to go after these financial people and the frauds and yada, yada, yada. 99% of the time, the person perpetrating the fraud is an employee of one of these companies, and the employer is more than willing to give up all of their email with a direct subpoena right to the employer. You don't need to go to the third party. It, you don't need to bypass. I mean, when you send a letter through the mail, that's protected. Our email, our cloud storage, our expectation of privacy and how the Fourth Amendment should translate needs to move forward into the 21st century. This is, it's really ridiculous to put that exemption out there. I, it, it just doesn't make any sense. Okay, so, I mean, what's, what's the prognosis for this? Do you, did, are you willing to speculate, Greg? Does, are we gonna get this onto the floor uh, without an amendment? I, yes. I think we will get it onto the floor. I think that there won't be an amendment. I think an amendment will be offered. I think we stand a very good chance of beating it. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yes. We're, we're, you know, we're talking about the sort of depressing state of this. We should add, right, that uh, at least with respect to content, stored content, email content, if you're in the Sixth Circuit, so Kentucky, Michigan, Ohio, and one other state, um, there's a, a ruling from the uh, that circuit court saying, actually, forget federal statute, the Fourth Amendment protects that. So if they come, if you're in one of those states and the, uh, they come to you saying, here's a subpoena, we want old emails, you can say no. Uh, in this circuit, no way. In the Ninth Circuit, we know that Google 
Microsoft, a bunch of other companies have been successful saying, because it's not, the, the Ninth Circuit rulings are not quite as explicit on this question yet, um, but there's favorable rulings in that direction. So those companies have also been successful in basically saying, no, if you want content, we're gonna tell you to come back with a warrant. And in practical terms, if they've gotta to go to a judge anyway to fight to enforce the subpoena, they sort of may as well get the warrant. And so they've been successful in the Ninth Circuit also in pushing back. So while it's important to get these reforms, um, it's not necessarily that you must turn over content um, you know, in response to a subpoena or a lesser order, like a 2703D order. A lot of companies have said no warrant and been, and been successful in that. So don't, don't think you can't push back if they don't come to you with a warrant. Right, you can push back, but it's one of those, like the, the law needs to be clarified yeah. because the courts have clearly moved too slow to solve this issue on their own. And you know, a lot of times you can say maybe you don't know where your, your customer might be located. And if you wonder if this is a really a problem, like how often it happens, um, for Google specifically, in um, their January transparency report, they noted that 68% of requests for user identifying information um, for our online data were through subpoenas, while only 22% were through search warrants. So, you know, I don't know if that's a function of the Sixth Circuit decision or some of these companies pushing back, but it's clear that this is something that needs to be straightened out because it should be 100% of user identifying information through a third party is done through a warrant and not through a subpoena. So, so let's let's talk a little bit about about that. Yeah, you have something you want to uh, want to add? I, 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 you know. Even though I'm a privacy advocate, I think it's unworkable to require a warrant for just basic subscriber yeah. information. But as we were talking earlier, uh, Julian was, once you want content of email or your web browsing or whatever it is, uh, a warrant. I think the issue, and you, you, I don't know your name, the, the lady over there. Katie. Katie. Katie, sorry, Ron. Uh, I can't see the names and yeah. I don't have a prompt, that um, the, uh, I think a problem is going to come up between a criminal warrant, and they say they have a warrant, but they call it an administrative warrant, and the probable cause requirement for a criminal warrant, they say, as you said, that there's a lower standard for the administrative stuff, and that's, that uh, there's no... It's a slippery slope. Well, Ron, let me let me ask you this: Why why are you making a distinction between customer data, just kind of basic subscriber information, and content? Why why is that an important distinction that you want to have made? Why not just have a warrant for all information that your customers give you? Every warrant's going to be a John Doe warrant. They don't know your name. They don't know anybody. They don't know a date. They don't even know if they are a subscriber of yours. So just basic, yes, we have a subscriber, you know, at that uh, IP address on that date and time. And uh, they're thus and so, their address, which can be totally fictitious, and the requirement that how they paid, you know, from check, money order, cash, credit card. Right. And those but beyond that, warrant. And yeah, we'll put I mean that, that, I'm, gonna, I'm sorry. No, yeah. Well, the transactional data is also that's important for being able to to build the case so that you can have a probable cause warrant for the content. Yes. So yeah, and that's I mean that's you know the subpoena for that from the third party is fine, but then a warrant to go to the actual holder of the content for you know to come directly to me and say go through your you know I need email that's on this particular topic. Because you can't have a third party go through and do the process of, of sifting through what is and what isn't, um, you know, germane to the investigation, right? My, an email to my grandmother shouldn't be going to law enforcement. And, you know, there are other personal things that shouldn't be going out there. So I should have the ability to go through and figure out what is and isn't belonging to the investigation so, process. So, you, you, you have something yeah, you just want to, to Just to clarify, the world that we kind of want to move toward is this one. If the government wants, and, and, and we gotta account for the law enforcement interests, right? They, they need to build an investigation with the lesser intrusive um, information and build up to probable cause and uh, get a warrant. But if they only get the warrant when they're pretty certain that the information um, uh, is about a real crime. So you start with the least intrusive information, the subscriber information. Who belongs to this email? 
Where do they live? How do they pay for their bill? That kind of thing you get with a warrant, with a, I'm sorry, with a subpoena. Um, and then you move up to the transactional records. Who did they email? Who emailed them? Um, that kind of information you, you get with uh, a thing in ECPA that's known as a 2703D order. It means you gotta go in front of a court and, and prove not probable cause, but um, a standard called specific and articulable facts that the information you seek is relevant and material. Um, next level, final level, you get the warrant. And for that, you've got to prove probable cause that the um, information pertains to a crime. So um, again, climbing up this ladder, that's the world we're trying to work toward. We're not at that world right now, because right now you can get a lot of content with just a subpoena. And right now, those telephone records are in the subscriber information category where they really don't fit very comfortably. Okay. That's right, I agree with all of that, but just to, I also agree with the, the idea that, that basic subscriber information is, is sort of one of these categories that you sort of have to let them get with a subpoena for this reason, right? Um, warrants have to be particularized, right? So if it's a warrant, it means you got to have a reason, you got to be able to show by probable cause that this particular place, in this case meaning, let's say, this particular data storage facility or company is a place where I will expect to find the evidence. Now, that becomes, in, in effect, impossible if you're investigating someone and you don't know where they're storing their data, right? You can't, if you don't know where they're storing their data and there's five companies where they might be storing it, um, you can't get a warrant for any of them until you have a particular reason to believe that that person is storing their data in that place. So they have to be able, before they go to get a warrant, to come to you with some kind of process and say, we need you to confirm that this person has an account here, this person has information here, um, otherwise it really it, it really would become impossible. Okay, um, I think I think we have a question here. Uh, yeah, um, so uh, Rick, uh, when you were talking about the, the ladder of uh, progression you need to go through, uh, where in that ladder does the data from a mobile phone chirping away, giving away location information, where does that fit within that ladder? Okay, so, th so the question, the question is, um, what do we do with, with location information? Um, it's a mystery. <laughs> um, one of those mysteries of technology. No, um, there's no standard set forth in ECPA for when law enforcement can access cell site location information in real time. There's, there's uh, prospectively. So what do they have to do to get a, uh, in order to get prospective disclosure of your location? There's no standard in ECPA. Now, law enforcement says that there is a standard in ECPA for uh, location from storage, and that is a, that it's a transactional record, although one circuit court ruled about a year ago that the uh, magistrates can require more than um, just this um, intermediate level of scrutiny that they could require a warrant for it. So that issue too is up in the air. Um, so what do we do in Washington? Well, we try to get legislation to raise the standard up to a full warrant for the location data, both from storage and um, prospectively. Uh, and that legislation's pending, I think, not nearly as far along as the warrant for content legislation. Okay. I'd like so, to, yeah, Ron has a Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, here in Texas, uh, just recently, uh, we have basically um, passed a statute unanimously both the uh, Democratic Party, Republican Party, and the governor that reforms ECBA for the state of Texas. Okay, the 180-day rule, out. Email is protected. Now, subscriber information, like we've all discussed here, they've, in order to build probable cause, they're gonna need basic, but the content of the email, you need a warrant. So all that warrant language, and I can say we put the warrant language in uh, Senator Leahy's ECBA version. Uh, Andy understands how all that works in Washington, but likewise here in Texas, we put that language in there for warrant. They tried to put an answer to the gentleman about geolocation. Some other privacy people tried to make the warrant from the very beginning for subscriber information, everything, you gotta have a warrant, and a warrant for the geolocation information. As it sits, that all had to get excised to, in order to pass it. It's silent 
uh, in other words, you got to have uh, you, you give up the subscriber. You got to have a warrant for the email, and the in the geolocation is left silent for another day or for litigation. But that's left silent in Texas. So in Texas, you have email protection that you don't have in the other enlightened states, and in the federal government uh, with the ECPA. We'll see what happens, but. Uh, um, uh, you know, store your mail in Texas. Okay, so, so with 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 all with with all of this, um, yeah. You have a question. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, don't you think one of the most important things to uh, You've got to, you've got to be, you have to learn how to say no to law enforcement. You just don't roll over. So you may ask for the kitchen sink, sir, FBI, whatever it is, but I'm going to give you name, address, when they connected, when they disconnected, bytes transferred, but not where they went, what they did, what they said. Eh. You may put it in there. That does, so let's go to court. And you know what? You turn them down. Well, they'll go to the one that rolls over and gives it to them. So, so that that was that was. I, I want to put Jane on the spot a little bit here. Um, I mean, how how do you say no to law enforcement? I mean, how how do you balance kind of your customers' privacy interests and and, and the, their concerns about the data that they're giving you with these kind of law enforcement requests that essentially say we're not going to tell you where the line is. Yeah, I think um, that, that's a really good question. I think first we, in terms of advocacy for our customers, we do start with our customers. I mean, they've entrusted us with their personal information and a lot of data that's on our servers. And um, they have a right to know when we're going to turn that information over. Um, many of our customers are small businesses, so we always like to tell even our support staff that we shouldn't assume the worst of our customers to begin with. Um, so in terms of subpoenas, we've pushed back on a number of occasions if oftentimes they will ask for, say, just a, an IP address uh, that's shared, so there will be hundreds of customers on there, and there's no way that we can isolate <coughs> the one that they're looking for. Um, I think we've had some law enforcement push back and try to get all that information, but we won't, we won't turn it over and we'll require them to give us a domain or an email address. And we, our policy is also to require a warrant for content. Okay. So, you had a question? I actually, yeah. So, so, the, so the, the the question is, how come we don't have someone from the FBI up here talking about um, how how we're how they're keeping <laughs> buildings from exploding? Um, well, actually, you know, we do. Uh, it, it is a balancing act, right? Because we are in the middle of this every day. We have. Um, we're the custodians of a lot of information, and sometimes we can be helpful to law enforcement. Um, we do have one example shortly after 9-11 where in response to a warrant, um, we actually gave information to Scotland Yard that led to the arrest of three terrorists in the act of bomb making, and we received a thank you note afterwards. So, you know, it, 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 it is a difficult um, balancing act at times, but I think that it would be helpful to be more transparent with your customers about exactly under what circumstances will you release information and what information will be released. Okay. Um, so are there, are there any, any other questions from the floor? Yep. So, 
So, so why, why is Google different than the FBI? Well, I mean, you're also looking at an, nope. an aspect of choice, right? So I can choose to use Google or you can choose to use something um, like DuckDuckGo has more privacy protections or even um, Microsoft and Bing. You know, they have, they have different ways of, you know, using your information or not using it. And so that's a, there's a choice there, whereas this is something where the government can take this information and actually prosecute you. And there is a certain level of that kind of privacy. I mean, that is protected. You're protected against this kind of search and seizure by the Fourth Amendment, and it should be applied. Whereas um, someone else may want to talk a little bit more about consumer data, but again, there's there's an aspect of choice that's involved in that. Yeah, uh, we CDT we're advocates of consumer privacy as well. We tend to put them on separate tracks when it comes to our advocacy, particularly in Congress, because they tend to move on separate tracks. Um, um, we're advocates of a baseline privacy statute so that everyone's data would be protected at a baseline level. Maybe some data gets more protection than other data, um, but there's a baseline. Right now, um, the U.S. doesn't have that, Europe does. Um, what we're talking about, though, is, as Katie said, is um, law enforcement and um, government, and you know, the worst thing that can happen to you, it seems with the companies, is they'll advertise to you, and the government can put you in jail. So there's, uh, I think, a different interest at stake in terms of this, this context, right? I mean, I do think there are sort of historical and general philosophical reasons to be particularly concerned about, you know, what intelligence agencies do more than what Amazon uh, is trying to do. Um, but also, I mean, you, in this context, right, you may, as a user, care what Google is doing with your data. But I also assume that as people who work with companies that provide hosting services and things like that, that, that what's sort of relevant, most relevant to you from a business perspective is likely to be, um, the engagement with the government when they come demanding information about your customers. So um, whether or not you think kind of in the grand scheme of things, um, this is more important than the consumer end, um, I just sort of figure that it, if you're here, in a sense, as a business person, um, that is the, the aspect of it that has the most you know, sort of effect on you directly. Dave, can I go back to something that Jane said earlier? Yep, it, but oh, um, sorry. Ron, Ron gets to go first. Th thanks, Greg, for uh, David. I'd, I'd say this too. You might uh, some some of that basic customer information that we evilly log, though we don't log where you go, what you do, but you know, just stuff that comes out of our connection logs, is necessary for us because we're a victim of the fraud and the crime. If you're an online service provider, you have to deal with a certain amount of fraud, deceit, theft that go, that we're the victim of. So some of that is for us just to minimize the loss within the first month or two of a customer being a subscriber because we're not part of the free lunch bunch on the internet because there's no free lunch. They're, you know, they're, they're surveilling you for freedom. It's a very high cost. Your, your free lunch is a very high expensive lunch. So if you're Googling, you got to find a way to hack Google to where they get phony information. But nevertheless, some of that subscriber information is necessary to protect the provider so they can give you the service. But a lot of it's just common law crime uh, that none of y'all want. You want law enforcement to be able to respond and protect you and your home and your property from. Uh, so it's, a, it's an individual decision. And uh, one quick thing, uh, endurance here, they're a hoster. We run data centers that we you know rent or lease, license the space to hosters, large scale hosters. Um, and uh, the FBI wants us to go into their servers and get the content off. And they send us a search warrant. And then that becomes the wrestling match. Uh, nope. <laughs> um, why don't you contact Endurance here? They're a legitimate company. They would respond. But you all start going in here, you're going to take down all their innocent customers trying to find the one. And that's the, the blunderbuss that we're all, you know, you all know the recent mega upload case, of course, but the Steve Jackson Games case, where the Secret Service busted into Austin to Steve Jackson Games and took their servers, took down all their innocent customers, took Steve out of the business of Illuminati Online Games, and, uh, and it prompted 
It was the cause celebrity for founding EFF. But here, Mega Upload's just another Steve Jackson games, and I've seen it too. They just want to take it all and hurt all the under uh, the customers they have who are innocent for the one. Uh, so you got to say no and make them focus. Sorry. Yeah. So I mean, at, to, to, to that end, one of my one of my clients, um, I was talking to the Department of Justice, and they said, "Well, just take down the server and tell the customers that you had an outage." Yeah. <laughs> and I, I I thought to myself, okay, there are so many things wrong with with that statement. But I'm, I'm not really going to go into this. And so I, I, I did the, 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 the typical consumer trick. I said, can I talk to your supervisor? Um, so Greg, you, have, you had something you wanted yeah, to say. Just, I just wanted to ask Jane. So you get, there's two kinds of process. There's the one that says, um, here, I'm giving you this. Turn over information about your customers. This is a national security investigation. And you are gagged. You can't tell your customer that you got this. You can't tell anyone that you did. And then there's this other one, the subpoena. And it says, well, we want to subpoena these records. It's, I think there's a crime. Um, and uh, boy, we sure don't want you to tell your customer about it. Um, how do you decide whether the customer gets notice, given that the law permits you to give notice and law enforcement doesn't want you to? Yeah. Um, so I, I actually did review a few of our subpoenas and a lot of them do require confidentiality the criminal ones so when they do um, we're obligated to um, follow the, the rule to comply with the request um, we are moving toward notification um, this isn't something you know in the past I think that, that we've done as a normal matter but um, it, it, I think that it would do a lot toward a move Toward con transparency and protection of customer privacy. So, so, Kurt, yes. What about the notion, and a lot of people in here are hosting companies. We're all making the assumption that because the data is on our server, we have the ability and the right to go in and take that data and give it to anybody. And in many cases, we don't have that right. We may not even have access to the data, physical, logical, or otherwise. If it, you know, it's physically on servers that we may, may manage, uh, in our case, it's all virtualized. So, um, you know, there are dedicated servers for each individual, but, and we have, the, we know that we can say snapshot the volume, and that's a customer's data, but we don't have the right to do it, contractually or legally, because it's not our data. We don't profess to do any data management or any logical access control. So aren't all these, these ploys by the government just lazy? Uh, legislation to allow them to come to us to get where, 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 where what the proper thing would, to do would be to come to us and say, is this a subscriber of yours? Yes, it is. Thank you very much. They go away and they subpoena the customer because I don't have access to the data. So for me to try to do something like that violates my contract. In some cases may violate state law in, in Texas, for instance. So. I mean, where does that come down? It seems like we're all assuming that because we have the data that it's ours to turn over, but it really isn't. I mean, it's like the landlord, right? If you're a landlord of a, ten, uh, of a rental house, you may have a key, but your, your rental contract states that you don't have the, the unfettered ability to walk in the house at any time. Right. I use the storage locker analogy all the time. So. Well, one of the things that would, would solve this issue in particular for you would be if the legislation that was put out by Senator Leahy and Senator Lee, um, which also Senator Cornyn and Senator Cruz have been very supportive of, if that were passed, then it wouldn't be a question for you anymore. So, I mean, and we're looking at that, again, as, as Greg noted, that it's going, it's very positive and your involvement in getting these kinds of legislations passed so that you don't have to make that determination. You don't have to explain to them, whereas, no, this isn't really how it works. And every time you're able to, you know, educate someone or a law enforcement official as to, no, this isn't really how it works. I can't really provide you with that. And then someone else comes along. So this will, you know, give you back some of your hours as well if some kind of common sense legislation like this goes forward. So that's, that, that's, that's, I, does, does anyone have any questions on the floor? I'm, I'm fixing to wrap things up. Up, oh, yep. So, uh, on protection, I mean, in the bad old days of the internet, I mean, you never expected on the internet anything privacy or any data. So, and I'm wondering, I mean, now, essentially, we find the government is in there just like everyone else as one of the bad guys trying to get your data.
Okay. Can I hit that? Yep. So this is, uh, that's, that's one good solution. One problem with that, and this is, I think, probably moving to the back burner in, in, in light of the uh, ongoing revelations about NSA surveillance, but the FBI for several years has essentially been pushing what they call their Going Dark Project, um, which is to, so basically motivated by the worry that services like Silent Circle and Spider Oak and Kim.com's New Mega, which, which do provide that kind of security by implementing end-to-end -end encryption so they don't hold the keys, uh, meaning even if they're compromised, the, the information is secure. That's a model we're seeing uh, you know, sort of rolling out increasingly. FBI claims that this is causing them to go dark, meaning they can no longer go to the provider and demand access. And so they have been pushing very strongly for legislation that would effectively prohibit that model, that would fine businesses at astronomical and doubling rates um, who are unable to produce the content that their customers have installed. It's probably not your fault if they just stored something that they themselves encrypted, but if you have anything to do with sort of providing the functionality that, that implements that end-to-end -end encryption, um, and it is not built so that you can essentially unlock that content, you're subject to incredibly punitive fines. And so um, that is one solution. It's a solution we're seeing adopted. Its viability will depend on legislation like that not passing. Right. And so to, to that end, um, one, one of the things that you can do to, yep, yeah, all right, I'll let you have the last question. The, so if we don't, this is one of these things they've been batting around for a couple of years. We've, no one has actually seen the draft legislative text, except you know, maybe a tiny handful of people. But yes, um, again, they may be scared off at the moment by controversies about surveillance. But my understanding of the proposal is that, so, right, I mean, if, if you just have Dropbox and a user on their own machine, you have nothing to do with it, has encrypted a file and uploaded it, then that's not your fault. You, get, you, you give them, you, you can give them essentially what you were given in the first place. But if it's a situation like Spider Oak or Mega um, or any other service where the provider's software is somehow involved in providing the end-to-end -end encryption functionality, then yeah, the proposal there is, the, no, the, the, the functionality has to be designed such that the provider retains a mechanism to provide access to the plain text. So um, for, for people who are interested in learning more about um, PRISM and um, the, the, NS, the NSA, uh, we have a surprise went panel tomorrow at lunch. Um, Greg is going to be on the panel. Elliot Noss from Two Cows is going to be on the panel. I'll be on the panel. And it's going to be moderated by Christian Dawson. It's going to be in the lunchroom uh, at lunchtime tomorrow. Um, People who are interested in um, moving some of these legislative uh, issues ahead, I really encourage you to, to join with us. That's the only way that this stuff is going to happen, uh, that changes are going to be made, is if we're actually proactive and work together to get changes made. Um, I think the panelists are going to be around for a while for people who have specific questions, like if you want to talk about Kalia two more. Um, I think that they're happy to talk about it, but if y'all would uh, join me in thanking uh, the panelists for being here.